Hi, and thank you very much uh, I mean, to the Indian American Forum. I'm, I'm very privileged and happy to be here and share my thoughts with you. And this reminds me of the last time I was in America, and this is not very long ago. This was just this year, February, before coronavirus took place and before de India's democratic institutions formally started crumbling. And I remember the last time I was there, I traveled to uh, several states and cities in America, and I was addressing Indian Americans there. And there, a lot of people thought that me, when I was talking about hope and how I saw light at the end of the tunnel, because this was the time when these whole CA and RC protests were going on. And some, maybe people thought that this was foolhardy of me to be so optimistic about India's future and also about India's future, whether it will be a democracy or not, whether it will be a secular democracy or not. But for someone like me who sees things on the ground and I've been covering issues for the last at least two decades and especially issues of the marginalized communities, I saw very, very empowered and a sense of empowerment in the marginalized and the most marginalized sections of Indian society. And those were India's Muslim women. Not long ago, we were talking about, uh, you know, talking about a savior for them, that they needed to be saved from their own people, from their own families, from their own customs and traditions. And these very women led a fantastic campaign for 100 days. There were other allies, there were students, there were other liberal people who believed in India's constitution and democracy. But the sense of empowerment and why I felt so hopeful, so optimistic, about India, Indian society, Indian democracy, and India's future as a secular democracy was because of these young people, because of these working class women who were out on the streets pledging to save India's constitution, pledging to save India's democracy. And that is why there was so much of hope. And that is why, you know, as someone who is a journalist, but also a broadcaster, I look at things from a very visual point of view. So what I saw was that for five long years, there was this political power that was trying to turn India's secular democratic character into a theocratic Hindu Rashtra. So here is secular Indian secular democracy and here is Hindu Rashtra. In between, there was this very firm, strong wall built by these young people, these women who said that you will have to go through us to this. So I was very hopeful that this wall was built by these people and that is why India's future will remain democratic and secular. But unfortunately, I am not so hopeful now, six months down the line. I cannot really say that the future of democracy, future of dissent uh, is so uh, bright and optimistic in India at the moment. And especially the way we can already witness the kind of um, vindictiveness um, coming from the establishment. And that's so right. And that's happening also because of the fact that these 100 days and the people who stood for India's constitution, democracy, and everything that is dear to us, the whole idea of India, and that was something to, an, to the effect that the five years of hard work done by the current dispensation, these protests were undoing that hard work, undoing all of these efforts, the idea of India that they were offering the character of India, they were offering that a particular community is going to be the owners, these new, you know, this, this new group of people, they were thinking that they are the new masters of this country and everybody else who did not disagree with them will be second class citizens, whether they are going to be students or the liberals or intellectuals or scholars or Muslims or Dalits or Adivasis. And all of these people who felt that they were marginalized because of the political, social, and economic plans and policies of the government, they came together to protect the constitution. Because, you know, this is the whole idea. The constitution is not to protect the already privileged. As you said, I've been to Afghanistan and Iran and Iraq and so many other countries, you know. Trust me, even there is this small where democracy has completely collapsed and systems don't work. Um, there is hardly any secularism, there is hardly any equality. Even there, there is this elite class that has everything. Even there, people have their palaces, you know. Afghanistan Kabul So so constitution and laws are not to protect the privilege. Basically, these are 
these laws and constitution and system is to protect the most marginalized. So the most marginalized are protected by the constitution and that is why these were the very people who came out on the street to protect the constitution so that the constitution could protect them, their liberties, their rights. So for five long years, we saw this, a total absence of any credible opposition and the first pushback to the government, to Modi government came from our campuses, came from the people, the most unlikely section of the society. And that is why these days what we're witnessing is the hit back of the government, because this was, I think, very naive of us to think that this will not have any repercussions, that this will not have consequences. And why, and we are discussing today the constitutional institutions because India's Muslims, India's students, India's liberal class, India's farmers, laborers, Adivasis and Dalits, they trusted India's constitution and India's constitutional institution because they did not believe that Mr. Modi or Mr. Shah are going to turn into secular people overnight. And that is why they were protesting on the streets. They were not, they, they knew very much, very well that this is not what their plan is. But what they were trying to do is to tell the democratic institutions, to tell India, other people, and you know, kind of have a public opinion, uh, which was uh, against, which could have been against the AANRC, a very, very discriminatory law, which was not against, I would say, not just against uh, um, minorities, but also against India's constitution, the very, founding principles of Indian democracy. So, uh, so that is why, you know, the, the kind of uh, uh, this very vindictive uh, uh, policies that we see at the moment was because of this. Because if you look at just the character and identify the targets, so it is very instructive if you say the selection of targets, and I want to name these people, the people jailed so far on charges of conspiracy under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act or UAPA, for their alleged role in the Delhi riots, the large majority of these people are young students and scholars. So those jail include five women, all under the age of 31. Under the age of 31. Three of them, Natasha Narwal, Devangana, Sapura Zargar, are students. Ishra Jaha, she wants to be a lawyer. Gulfisha, she is an MBA graduate and also wants to become a teacher. And majority of the men who are in jail are young scholars. I think there is a moment when we have to now talk about Umar Khalid, that when he was arrested, I thought India's democracy and the future of dissent is very, very bleak now. Because it is not just Umar Khalid. Umar Khalid represented what India can offer to its most marginalized citizen. Umar Khalid was young, he was articulated, he was very brave. He was someone who I thought maybe would be a future leader. And he already was a leader. And that is why he became, overnight, he became a youth icon. So with him, when you incarcerate him, you actually incarcerate whole Indian aspiration of an India that is available to its disadvantaged communities. So that is why I feel that this is a moment, this is a time for all of us to pause, to stop and think whether democratic institution, constitutional institutions are doing its duty or not. For, for someone like me, you called me brave, you called me courageous. I believe I am doing what I have been doing for the last 20 years. Trust me, there is nothing extraordinary. It is just the times are so extraordinary that my ordinary work, it stands out. But there is a price to pay for this. Every day, trust me, every day I do my program, Every day, whenever I'm going to post something on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at least five, seven times from seven, five, seven different angles, I'm reading myself, rereading myself, editing myself, you know, posting something before posting, I'm deleting because I know that there is a very vindictive system which is trying to use laws not to empower citizens, not to empower activists, not to empower students not to empower journalists, but to disempower them, to use it against them. And that is why it has become so difficult to now even do day-to-day, -day, everyday journalism, everyday work. If you are someone who happens to be, uh, you know, who happens to have a, a not so popular religious identity and you are do doing something that the, the establishment does not like, 
trust me, the state is coming for you. So it is not, I mean, a lot of people are commentators, you know, they make it look like kind of a contest, a fight between two communities. I am sorry, it is not a contest or a fight or a battle between Hindus and Muslims or Hindus and Sikhs or, or any two communities. It is a fight between people who are resisting the government and the state is coming for you with all its might. So that I would say is the problem at the moment that this assault, this whole assault on journalists, a very prominent uh, digital media organization, it was raided day before. You don't know what is waiting for, for other people, for people like me. Every day I get calls from friends. And, and this is why, you know, the problem is the any political party that feels that they are going to win elections because of a particular kind of politics that they're going to do, they will try everything that they have to. And they, these people say that they want to rule India for the next 50 years. So of course they can't rule India without dividing people on religious caste or any other uh, you know, divisions, uh, cleavages that we have. But it is the duty of India's constitution institutions to safeguard constitution, democracy, Indian citizens. I am very sad to say that I am losing faith and my faith, I would say on India's constitutional institution is very, very weak on 19th September, 2020. So the faith that I had six months ago, I cannot really say that I can give you as much hope as I gave you six months ago. I don't know what happened six months down the line, but at the moment today, India's future of dissent, future of democracy, future of secular democracy looks very bleak to me.